There's a word from the Lord that comes out of the book of James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. When you found that, say amen. If you're still looking, say, Lord, have mercy. I want you to know there's a device um, in the front. It's a literary device. It's in the front of your Bible, in the front of your smartphone. Uh, it's called a table of contents. Uh, and if you don't know, there's no shame in not knowing, no shame in your game. But if you're faking the funk, uh, you need to get real and just acknowledge that you need to use the table of contents. Hear the word of the Lord. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know the testimony of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Hear the reading of the scripture. May the word of God be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your pathway. You may be seated. I'm going to ask if you will, if you indulge me just a second more, if you will connect with the people in front of you and back of you and on both sides, you greet them, uh, uh, smile at them. And I'm not talking about one of those Jack Nicholson smiles from The Shining, but I just greet them and smile at them. Give them your real name, not your online name, but your real name. Now, if you will look at one of the persons with whom you've spoken, and if you will simply repeat after me, you will be tested. Thank you very kindly for having helped introduce the central theme of the sermon. I want to apply this tag to the text, the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith. Pray with me. Oh God, we gather in this place, this place that is hallowed by your presence. We know that you are here with us for you have declared that you would have the praises of your people. We know that you're here with us because you have promised that wherever two or three gather in your name, that you would be in our midst. We know that you're here with us because it was you who woke us up. It was you who carried us to this place. And we may think that we walked in here under our own steam, but we're here by virtue of your grace, your mercy, and your goodness. Oh, God, open us up. Make us receptive and responsive to the movement of your spirit. Help us to hear. But more importantly, oh, God, help us, oh, God, to apply your word to our lives. Now, God, I pray as I have before, what is dark in me illumined, what is low raise and support, that I might interpret your will and your way to your sons and your daughters. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and for his calls we pray. And the sons and daughters of God said, the testing of your faith the testing of your faith. This is a privileged piece of correspondence, an ancient email that's crafted by the Apostle James. The Apostle James is the premier pastor, if not the founding pastor of the, the Church of the Resurrection, the first multi-site megachurch. He writes, to an audience, not with whom he shares the same space, but rather the same spirituality. Not the same geography, but the same God. He writes at a time in which the church no longer is perceived as innocent and innocuous, but rather the church has fallen from the bottom of the list and soared to the top of the list of Rome as public enemy number one. The church has been accused of being subversive, but rather the church has not been subversive. The church has simply been true to the core values of our faith. They've not tried to be seditious, but rather they have sought to be in alignment with the will and the way of God. The church has been perceived as that entity that has disturbed the Pax Romana, the, the Roman way of life, because not of its political stance, but rather because of its spiritual grounding. The church has dared to demonstrate that it's committed to the, the tagline, Kaiser, or rather Christos Kerios, 
Christ is Lord, rather than Kaiser Kerios, Caesar is Lord. And as a consequence, the church has run the risk of losing life, liberty, and livelihood. There's pressure placed on the church from without, but then there's also tensions from within. A careful culling of this book this ancient email will reveal that there's some tensions within the churches to whom James writes. There are those who on one hand insist that reading the scriptures is really about accessing spiritual information. And there are those who believe that it's not about spiritual information, but rather it's about personal transformation. Be not simply a hearer of the word, but, but rather be a doer of the word. There are those who reason that the church ought to be converted into a kind of country club in which people of influence and affluence are shown deference. And there are others who reason that at the foot of the cross, we have learned to operate on an egalitarian ethic and that our churches ought not be the, those places that cater to people of influence and affluence, but rather it ought to respond to those who say whosoever will. Let him come. Whosoever will, let her come. And if there is to be any biased evidence, it ought to be towards the least loss and the left out. Tension between those who reason that they can say whatever they want to whomever they want, however they want. These are they who are incarnational, walking, talking ids. Just say whatever comes to mind. And those who reason that the tongue has power and as a consequence, you and I have to exercise our responsibility and be accountable for how we speak. We have to learn how to tame the tongue. There are those who reason that, that if it is a case that you're to experience healing, you have to make sure that you're in the hands of somebody with an MD or RN behind their names. And they are indeed God's agents of healing, but, but there are others who believe that, that not all of God's agents of healing, angels of healing, are, have RNs and MDs behind their name, but rather these are they who declare that if any among you are sick, let them call for the elders of the church and, and let the elders lay hands on them and pray for them, and those who are sick will indeed become well. Tensions from within and pressures from without. And he writes with the intention of trying to help the church think through their cluster of problems, to get perspective on the issues that are pressing upon them, to, to help them to think through what they have been wrestling with. And so he, he begins with a word of salutation, greetings. And then he says in this first clause, I love the King James Version, count it a joy, my brothers and sisters. Count it a joy. And uh, the NIV says, consider it a joy. It, it, it comes from a metaphor from the marketplace. Uh, it comes from a metaphor of accounting. And, and what it means is that uh, picture in your mind uh, an accounting with a ledger with assets on one side and, and liabilities on the others. And he's saying that, that whenever it is the case that you and I are, are wrestling with, with pressing issues, whenever it is the case that we find ourselves confronted with a complex cluster of issues, that, that we got a reason to rejoice, we got a cause to celebrate, and we got something to shout about. Consider it. A pure joy. I have to confess to you that when I first read this passage, I, I found it a bit puzzling. I, I found it to be problematic. Consider it a pure joy whenever you face trials of many kind? You mean I got a reason to rejoice when I got a problem that I've yet to work the, to iron the wrinkles out of? I got something to shout about? When it is the case that I, I deal with the slings and arrows of outrageous misfortune. Yes. He says, count it a pure joy. I, I can understand if it is a case that I have been out of work for several months and uh, Boeing or Microsoft has laid me off and, and I finally got the interview and not only did I get the interview, I, I aced the interview and I didn't just get the position that I want but when they called me back shortly after the interview, I, I didn't get the job that I wanted. They gave me a better job. But what about when you have been paying the, the pound of the pavement for six months, trying to float your resume, resume throughout LinkedIn, and you discover that, that you don't get linked at all times? 
I, I can understand if it is the case that, uh, that you have brought the project in on time and, and brought it in under budget and made sure that you empowered your team and, and everybody looked good, but, but what about when it is the case that you've done all of that and, and rather than receiving the recognition and the rewards, you get passed over. And a person who came in after you gets promoted over you. And you get no recognition. You, you get no props at all times. I, I can understand it if it's the case that, uh, that you're in an environment where everyone appreciates what you bring to the table. But, but what about when you work in a setting where people question your very presence and, and consider you no more than a, a quota phenomenon at all times? I can understand, praise the Lord, when it is the case that, uh, that you have uh, a marriage that has been made in heaven. Uh, but what about when it is the case that your, your holy wedlock has turned into holy deadlock? At all times? I, I can understand when it is the case that, uh, that you've given your best to your children, and your children in exchange are those who you have launched and they've done exceptionally well. But, but what about when your children are not uh, on the honor roll, but rather they're featured on America's Most Wanted? At all times. I can understand when it is the case that you have managed your money well and your, your pockets are bulging with the Benjamins, but what about when you're so broke you can't even change your mind? At all times. I understand when it is the case that you are able to manage your responsibilities as, as the person who's a part of the sandwich generation. You got children who are older that you're trying to raise and, and you got parents above you that you're trying to manage. And, but what about when you get caught in a squeeze and your parents have dementia and they are not appreciative of what you do, but rather everything that they say and do works, in, works antithetically against you the very structure you're trying to create that supports them. And, and what about when your children that you throw out prove they're part of the, the boomerang generation? You just throw them out, they keep coming back in. <laughs> At all times. I understand when it is the case that the, the Democrats and the Republicans have revealed in Congress that they, they understand that it takes two wings for the American public to fly. Uh, but what about when we've had eight years of gridlock? And we've had people who have taken into question the competency of the president and his credentials, not because his credentials are fraudulent, not because he's not competent, but rather simply because of the color of his skin. At all times. Can, can, I understand, praise the Lord, when it is the case that our, our schools are functioning as they should, but, but what about when you look across the landscape in this country and you discover, much to your dismay and chagrin, that the schools that are underperforming all seem to be in our community? And when you're asked to volunteer, you say that the schools ought to be doing their job because you got yours to do at all times. I can understand, praise the Lord, when it is the case that the pastor is going to be present for 52 weeks out of the year. But, but what about when the pastor resolves to be off for three months? Can, can you praise the Lord then? I've discovered as I, I scan this page, this ancient email, that, that what James shares with us at the outset is something that he understood only after the fact. That is to say that, that what James shares with us on the front end is something that he actually only understood on the back end because life must be lived forward but understood by looking backwards. And so James has lived through it, looked back on it, learned from it, and now James wants to sell to the satellite churches the t-shirt that says, I've been there, done that. You need not go through this alone, but I, I'm going to offer you some insight on how to handle things that are difficult and complex at all times. What I have discerned is that what James says on the front end is something that you and I are going to understand on the back end. So let, let's just suspend our shout for a moment. Count it a joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever. I, I appreciate that imprecise reference to time, whenever. That means your past, your present, or your future, whenever you experience trials. And no, notice that it's not singular trial, 
but plural trials and then notice that he does not simply say trials uh, but he says of many kinds and so it's not just a matter of having uh, a trial or trials, uh, so a plurality of problems, uh, but rather it's a matter of having a diversity and a plurality and a severity of a set of problems. And I don't know about you, it's one thing if I'm just managing money issues, but it's another thing when I'm managing issues of health, uh, I'm at managing issues of finance, I'm at managing relational issues uh, all at the same time. Is there anybody here who understands what it means to be caught in the vice grip of life? And you find yourself being squeezed to the point that you can no longer stand it and you wonder where God is. And at such moments, the bottom line is you discover whether you voice it or not that, that Ernest Becker was right when he declared that, that we are a homo poeta, man the meaning maker. Whenever something happens to us, we got to make some sense out of it. So we get philosophical. Why? And then not only do we get philosophical, we personalize it. Why me? And not only do we get philosophical and we personalize it, but then we theologize it. Why me, Lord? And what I want you to know is that the Apostle Paul says to you and me that, uh, that nothing has happened to us that, that is not common to every man and woman. But I love what he says. He uses the conjunction and. He says, and God is faithful. So you may have problems, but there's a problem solver. And God is faithful. In other words, you can, you can count on God to bring you through the crisis. You, you can lean back on the Lord whenever you are facing difficult circumstances. You can count on him. And he, he says and he will give you strength to stand up under the strain. There are some issues you got to endure. But, uh, but the way in which you are, are able to overcome them is that sometimes you just got to outlast them. And he says that when you are no longer able to stand up under the strain, He'll provide a way out for you. Is there anybody here who can testify? I know it's trite, but it's still true that, that the Lord can make a way out of no way. Is there anybody here who knows that sometimes we're looking for the Lord to deliver us from things and what the Lord does is the Lord delivers us through things. Have you ever stopped and thought about the fact that in Psalm 23 it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. There are some things in life that you and I can't negotiate. There are some things we can't bob and weave. There are some things that you and I just going to have to wrestle with and, and deal with. And could it be that the problem for many of us is that we fail to hear the words of James. He says, whenever you face trials. And the problem for some of us is that we don't face trials. We run from them. And I know that it is a case that we're given to the flight or fear instinct. It's a part of our genetic inheritance. But, but here is the thing that I want, to be, want you to bear in mind, that, that we've been called not simply to be persons who are given to that which is natural, but rather we've been called and empowered to do the supernatural. So there are some things that you ought not run from. In fact, M. Scott Peck says that the principal problem for some of us is that we have failed to deal with necessary suffering. And there are some things in life, the truth be told, that we got to learn how to face. In fact, your psycho-spiritual development has been arrested because you have chosen to, to duck and dodge that which God wants you to face. There are some issues in life that you must face. You cannot bob and weave. You can't duck them, but you got to deal with it because either you deal with them or they will deal with you. Whatever you, and in case you think I'm not talking to you, uh, what you need to know is it ain't me, it's the Apostle James. He uses the second person plural, uh, not the second person singular. It's not you as an individual, it's y'all. To use the deep dialect of the South. When, whenever y'all face trials, tr trials, you, you know what trials are, don't you? Uh, let me see if I can help you here. Um, I remember as a boy sitting by the bedside of my father, uh, my stepfather that is, and, and looking at his ankles and discovering that he had a deep gash down the exterior of his ankle and down the interior of his ankle, both ankles. And I was curious, so I asked him what had happened to him. And he told me that when he was a young man, he was walking down State Street in Chicago. And he was looking up at the sky and he was thinking about how good God had been to him. And as he walked down the street one night, uh, much to his surprise, uh, he was looking up. But there had been a manhole cover that had been left off. 
And so as he walked forward, he didn't see that the manhole cover had been left off. And he fell down uh, into the manhole and uh, fell about 15 feet, shattered both ankles. They had to be surgically reattached. You see, if he could have anticipated it, he would have avoided it. Uh, but he fell down. The truth of the matter is, if you and I could have anticipated the, uh, that uh, the crash of the market in 2008, we wouldn't have taken out those loans on houses that we couldn't afford. But, but we fell into a situation where we were upside down on our mortgage. If, if we had really listened to the doctor, and the doctor had been telling us to monitor our, and make sure that we monitor our health by exercising just a little bit and, and making sure that we changed our diet, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't have hypertension. We wouldn't have had the stroke that we have. We wouldn't be suffering from migraines. But the truth of the matter is we have fallen and slid into ill health if we had known if we had known uh, that taking those credit cards in college and purchasing stuff on the front end uh, and then and then paying for it for the rest of your life uh, if we had known that it was going to get us so deep in debt the truth of the matter is we would have cut up the cards as soon as we got them but, but we fell into a debtedness if we had known uh, that taking out the multiple loans from Fannie Mae for school was going to get us in a situation where we we're burdened by loans uh, that we're going to have to pay off for the rest of our lives and as a consequence we don't have the resources to help our kids build wealth because we're not passing on anything to them except our debt had we known maybe we'd have gone to school closer to home had we known maybe we would have worked and gone to school but but we took down major loans that now because of our profession and because of the economy we can't afford to pay back if we had known that all this preaching and teaching that the pastor's been doing and, and talking about small groups was to help equip us for dealing with everyday issues uh, and coping with crises as they popped up, we would have invested much more. But, but then, as Jesus says, when the storms came, because we had built some prefabricated houses, uh, instead of building the houses on the firm foundation, uh, we were swept away. And sometimes it is the case we discover that the tidal wave of emotion gets the better of us uh, because we've not built up the dam of belief. If you and I had worked on our faith when the weather was fair, when the weather got foul, we'd be able to stand still in the eye of the storm and, and know like our forebears saying, the storm is passing over, hallelujah. Be able to sing, I'm so glad trouble don't last always because you know that the testing of your faith, you know. I love that word you know there. That, that word know comes from a Greek word that, that does not mean uh, to know based on sheer speculation. It's not a priori knowledge. It's a posteriori knowledge. It's knowledge that we come to know from experience. Uh, we have experiences, we observe our experience, and we mine those experiences and extract from them that which is helpful, and they become gems on which you and I live our lives. We, we know there are some things that we act like we don't know, but we do know. Uh, let me see. Uh, I, I was at my church uh, a couple of years ago, and it was summer, and it was hot, like it's been here. And so there was a young sister um, who was outside, and she was sitting on the edge of these brothers, young brothers, uh, who were kind of holding court. And, and as they talked to each other, uh, she had waited there, uh, seemingly patiently patting her foot. Uh, but then when uh, she got fed up, she decided that she was going to walk through the crowd. And so she walked through the crowd and her fine brown frame stopped the brothers in mid-sentence from talking. And they watched her sashay through the crowd. And when she got to the edge of the crowd, she looked back over her shoulders and she said, Malik, you can front for your boys if you want, but you better act like you know and come on. And do you know that Malik shifted his behavior because of what he knew? I just came by here to tell you, we can act like we don't know. We can act uninformed. We can act ignorant. But, but there are some things that we know. We know that unless we deal with all the isms, the racism, sexism, homophobism, ageism, imperialism, unless we deal with it, it is really going to not simply destroy our country, but it's going to dismantle the church. 
We know that if we are just focused on standing on the premises and, and not focusing on taking Christ to the community, uh, uh, then millennials will avoid to opt, will opt to opt out of the church in massive numbers. Uh, we know that we'll never get men uh, by feminizing the gospel uh, and preaching it in such a way uh, that we build a culture in the congregation uh, that's antithetical to the sensibilities of brothers. Uh, we know uh, that as long as we're alive, we're going to have to pay debt. We're going to have to deal with death and taxes. Uh, there are some things that we know. Uh, we know that all things work together uh, for the good of them that love the Lord uh, and are called according to his purpose. Uh, we know that we can be steadfast, uh, immovable, always abounding uh, in the grace of God. Uh, we know that if my mother or father forsake me, uh, the Lord will take me up. Uh, because you know that the testing of your faith, I, I won't be before you much longer. Here's the interesting issue. He says the testing of your faith. What he wants us to infer from this uh, is that when we go through things, God's not trying to punish us but rather God's trying to perfect us. Uh, God's not trying to, God's not trying to demote you, uh, but rather God's trying to develop you. Uh, God's not finding fault with you. God's trying to form you. Uh, he says the testing of your faith. Uh, there are some things through which you must go uh, that God will use uh, to help you to grow. Uh, God doesn't just want you and I to go through things. Uh, God wants you and I to grow through what we go through. Uh, is there anybody here who understands? Uh, he doesn't just want you to endure. Uh, he wants you to elevate and the problem with some of us I don't mean to sound insensitive is that we're still riding on the spiritual yellow bus a bit the short bus because we have not learned that God's been trying to teach us a lesson since we were 20 since we were 30 since we were 40 and we still ain't learned our lesson yet there is in physics I'm told what's called the the failure point. We know the failure point. The failure is when you place pressure on an object and the object breaks. But then there's also what's called the yield point. And that's when you place pressure on an object and rather than it, rather than it breaking, uh, it may buckle, but it shows its resilience. It shows its strength. And what God's trying to show you uh, in the midst of difficulty is that if we put our trust in him, uh, we will discover that we're stronger, wiser, uh, and better than we were uh, when we come out on the other side uh, than when we went in the first place. Uh, because we know, uh, well, I leave you with this. Uh, I, I remember very distinctly when my daughters was much, were much younger, uh, my daughters uh, had me to make sure that I didn't take myself too seriously. Uh, so they had me watch with them cartoons. Uh, there were some Saturday mornings where I just sat up and watched cartoons with them. Uh, and I have to confess, I didn't just do it for them. Uh, I'm still a big kid at heart. Uh, so I was watching cartoons with them one uh, Saturday morning when they were about three and five. Uh, and I tell you, there are some things that you will do for love uh, that you won't do for anything else. Uh, they had their daddy, grown daddy, uh, watching the Powerpuff Girls. I, I'm sitting there with my daughters watching the Powerpuff Girls one Saturday morning, uh, and I'm thinking about any and everything else than the Powerpuff Girls. Uh, I'm simply enjoying spending time with them uh, because that's what kids really remember. Uh, they don't always remember what you were doing with them. Uh, they just remember that you did it with them, uh, that you spent time with them and showed them that you valued them. Uh, well, in the middle of our uh, TV watching, uh, uh, the Powerpuff Girls were in, was interrupted, uh, and there was a voice that came on, uh, and when the voice came on a test pattern came on and when the test pattern came on the voice explained that for the next 60 seconds there would be a test of the emergency broadcasting system well my daughters didn't understand what was going on they were disoriented and they were discombobulated because they want to watch the Powerpuff Girls in fact my younger daughter who's my namesake looked up at me and she said daddy what's wrong I want to see the Powerpuff Girls I said baby don't worry about it it'll be back on in a second. Uh, my oldest daughter looked at me rather curiously uh, and she said, Daddy, how do you know uh, that the Powerpuff Girls uh, will be back on in a few seconds. Uh, how do you know uh, that things are going to pick up where they left off? Uh, and I just said to them, uh, well, baby, didn't you hear what the man said? Uh, he said that only for the next 60 seconds, 
Y'all will catch me in a second. The next 60 seconds, uh, there would be a test of the emergency broadcast system. Uh, and it was only a test. Uh, well, I come back here to tell somebody this morning uh, uh, at a New Beginnings Church, I don't know what you're wrestling with. Uh, I don't know what you're trying to iron out. Uh, but I can tell you that it's only a test. Uh, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Uh, it's only a test. Uh, I once was young, uh, and I'm now old, uh, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Uh, it's only a test. Uh, the Lord is my life uh, and my salvation. Uh, whom shall I fear? Uh, the Lord is the strength of my life. Uh, of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, it's only a test. Uh, though my mother and father forsake me, uh, the Lord will uh, take me up. Uh, it's only a test. Uh, and one day on a blood soap, uh, when swept here, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, submitted to a test. Uh, he said, Father, forgive them, uh, for you know not what they do. Uh, he said, Father, into thy hands uh, I commend my spirit. Uh, and he passed the test uh, because he gave up the ghost. Uh, he gave his head to the crown of thorns, uh, his hand to the sphere, uh, his side to the sphere. Uh, and then they buried him in a borrowed tomb, uh, but he passed the test. Uh, he wasn't idle, uh, my record says, uh, uh, that he went down in the Hades, uh, preached the emancipation proclamation uh, to the captives that were there and early on Easter Sunday morning uh, he graduated summa cum laude uh, with all power in his hands uh, saying oh death 